Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome to the first virtual YSA event. I'm pleased so many familiar names and so many new ones to the BSSM are able to join us here today. I'm Dr. Harry Rohr from Swansea University, and I'm here alongside Dr. Mulvey Hill from University of Glasgow to chair proceedings. The YSA is a long-standing special session usually held within the main annual conference. Although we had to postpone the main conference until next year, and hopefully we can welcome you in person to the conference in Oxford, we decided to run the YSA and keep the tradition of this event running. The YSA aims to put spotlight on the fantastic work being undertaken by early career researchers, whether from industry or postgraduate study. And I'm sure this is just a preview of more great work to come. I'd like to thank the organising committee, the judges and the local assistants from here at Swansea for helping us to put this event on. I'd also like to thank the applicants we had for the competition. We had over 20 entries this year and the judges had a tough time getting us down to the final four. But here we are now in the final. For the speakers, you're aware of the timing that we have. Um, but hopefully this won't be an issue. But for the audience, if you have any questions for the speakers, please post in the Q&A, and we'll try to field as many of those questions as possible within the permitted time. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Daniel to introduce our panelists and our first speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Harry. So I'd just uh, like to echo what Harry said in thanking the judges and the attendees and um, to uh, introduce the uh, judging panel is Yang Zhu from the University of Glasgow, uh, Liz Tanner from Queen Mary University, Adrian Murphy from Queen's University of Belfast, Fabrice Piron from University of Southampton, Sally Gongor from uh, the Open University, and Firas Korkis from Swansea University. Our first speaker uh, is um, from Imperial College London, Alfredo Fanetti. Good afternoon to everyone. Today I'll talk to you about novel ultrasound measurements to characterize friction. First, I will tell you something about uh, the context. I work in the turbo machinery industry, and one of the main concerns for the community is to be able to predict the dynamic, uh, the vibrational behavior of the engines. And uh, this is important because resonance vibration might lead to large stresses in the structure. And this, due to the high frequency vibration, can lead to cycle fatigue. Unfortunately, it's quite challenging to predict the vibrational behavior. And one of the main reasons is that in the engine, there are thousands of components in contact. For example, there are contact at the um, attachment between uh, shaft and disc or bolted joints or there are contacts at the blade roots in the turbines, for example. So the problem is that when the body vibrates, there is friction between them, and we don't really understand how friction affects the dynamical behavior. But actually, it's quite important to model friction because friction introduces damping that is very beneficial to the, um, the reduction of vibrations. Uh, the problem is that we cannot directly access interfaces uh, during um, vibration because it's quite challenging experimentally. And this is the reason uh, why in the present study, uh, I want to use the ultrasound technique to access and monitor friction contacts during vibrations. I will first, I will first show you how do we actually model contact in dynamic simulations. Then I'll show you the friction ring that we use to measure contact parameters. And finally, the ultrasound experiments. So let's, for example, think about uh, root contact uh, between the blade, turbine blade and disc. We can imagine that if this is the pressure distribution of the contact, for example, here we have a low pressure. So there is uh, there will be during vibration a lot of motion due to separation. Where we have high pressure, we will have a stick condition and therefore a reduced motion. And finally, where there is a mild pressure, there will probably be slip. And this is very important because when there is a slip, there is an energy dissipation that introduces damping. The way we model these different contact states is by means of the hysteresis loop. That is a plot of the friction force 
exchange between two sliding components and their relative displacement. This phases loop is characterized by the friction coefficient and the normal load that characterize the friction limit at which we start to slide. And then there is the tangential contact stiffness that characterizes the stick portion of this stereosis loop. Now, the most important part of this stereosis loop is the area inside the loop that is the energy dissipated. And it's very important for us to accurately capture the energy dissipated to predict the vibration of behavior. As said, we don't have currently predictive models for the contact behavior because we still need experiments to improve the physical understanding. We measure in imperial hysteresis loops by means of a high frequency friction rig. Um, the rig is composed by a moving block that moves backward and forward and is excited by means of a shaker that applies an harmonic excitation. And then here there is the contact between two specimens. There is the top specimen that slides over the, uh, the static specimen. We measure the relative displacement between the two specimens by means of the uh, laser beams and all the friction force that is transmitted in the contact goes into these load cells. So when we plot the force, the force from those load cells versus the displacement, we obtain this stereosis loop. We also ensure a continuous contact by applying a normal load by means of a pneumatic actuator. This is a photo of the rig and uh, here actually there is the contact. This is a close view of the specimens. They are cylindrical and they have a flat contact and we actually measure with the laser very close to the interface so that what we measure is really the, um, uh, due to the interface and not to the bulk deformation of the structure. So again, What's the motivation of the study? We need to directly access contact interfaces because to validate hysteresis measurements, because hysteresis loops only provide information on the side contact, but we actually don't know what's going on inside the contact. That's why we have prograded the friction rig to actually uh, use the ultrasound technique. This is the, um, the, the, the setup, these are the specimens, the top specimen slides, and we measure, as said, the relative displacement with, with the two laser. And we also mounted an ultrasound, ultrasonic transducer on the top specimen that generates an ultrasonic wave. Ultrasonic waves are uh, acoustic waves with a very large frequency, more than 20,000 Hertz. And once the wave is generated, it goes, it travels through the material until it hits the contact zone. In the contact, part of the wave will be reflected back and recorded by the transducer of the moving specimen. Part of the wave will be transmitted through the contact and be recorded by the transducer too. Now, the amount of reflection and transmission depends on the degree of contact. For example, if we have a very large normal load, the real area of contact will be very large, and therefore there will be a large transmission through the contact. While if the specimen are detached, there will be full reflection and no transmission. We can use the information on the reflection and transmission to get more information about the contact state. And the, our goal is actually to uh, monitor what happens while the contact vibrates. It's important to notice that the only previous study in which uh, stereosis loops have been compared with the ultrasound um, has already been conducted, but in that study, um, stereosis loop were recorded quasi statically. So the load was applied, then was stopped, and the ultrasound was sent. While in our experiments, um, we record in real time the ultrasound during vibration with very high frequencies up to 1000 Hertz. And our goal is to check what actually happens during the vibration because this is very important uh, in the turbo machinery industry because we want really to know what happens in the contact during vibration. And uh, this is just a simulation to show you what happens to the ultrasound that is generated, goes to the interface and then is reflected back. What's reflected back is recorded again by the transducer. This is a typical signal. So this is the incident signal. And after only seven microseconds, the transducer receives the reflection. The same occurs to the transmission that is 
And uh, what we use in our simulation is actually, in our um, experimental data, is actually the maximum in the reflection and transmission. Now we show you the experimental measurements. Because of a lack of time, I will just show you the most exciting result that we found. So we measured many stereosis loops at different sliding distances. You can see that when the sliding distance is very small, the stereosis loop is only a stick. While when we increase the sliding distance, we actually enter in gross slip. What we did, we sent actually many ultrasound bursts within the stereosis loop because we wanted to there was any variation. You can see that when we sent bursts within one hysteresis loop in stick condition, the ultrasound transfers constant. This means that we cannot really use ultrasound to understand if contact is a static or is a stick in stick vibration because it's constant. But actually, what happens to the ultrasound during gross slip is this. This is very nice and novel observation because we can actually notice that when we enter in gross sleep, there is a large variation in the ultrasound transmission. We can actually see two peaks and we didn't know if those peaks were actually correlated to the beginning of the stick condition or they were during gross sleep. For this reason, we synchronized the hysteresis and ultrasound measurements. And what we found is this. So here I'm plotting again the hysteresis loop, but with color bars, I'm showing the um, ultrasound uh, transmission intensity within the loop. So we can see that when it's yellow, there is the maximum transmission. And actually the maximum transmission is during the beginning of the stick. And as soon as we start the sliding, we have a reduction in the transmission. This is um, kind of expectable because when we start to slide, we are actually reducing the conflictivity between the phases. Something similar has already been observed with the optical measurements that revealed that at the onset, on the, at the onset of sleep, there is a reduction in the contact area. But actually, something uh, interesting happened that when we increased even more the sliding distance, we could still observe the reduction from the beginning of stick to slip. But actually there is a large asymmetry between the bottom friction limit and the top of the friction limit. After um, many investigation, we found out that mm, the friction rig kinematics changes during the two uh, direction of vibration because there is a normal load variation, a normal load increase in one direction and a normal load decrease in the other direction. And that's why um, the ultrasound transmission in one direction is slower and in the other direction is larger. So thanks to the ultrasound, we could also pick this strong normal load variation within uh, the vibration cycle. So concluding, uh, we used the ultrasound technique to successfully, in combination with the stereosis loops measurements. For the first time, we observed the large variability in the transmission uh, during vibration due to changes in the contact state. And uh, we conclude that we can really use ultrasound to detect stick and slip phases in frictional contacts. And this is very important because we can use now this technique to monitor contacts in real engine structures that undergoes icyclic stresses. And this is very important because it can provide us with validation data that we need for our um, models of uh, friction because we can really detect the changes in uh, uh, contact states during vibration. And the final aim is of course to um, use those models to design better components to reduce stress and uh, uh, high risks of a cycle for me. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Alfredo. Uh, now we have time for um, questions from the judges and from the attendees. Yeah. How do, this is Liz Tanner here. How do you, 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 you've, you've currently used in a very constrained setup with a stationary interface that you're looking at. In a moving engine, your, the position of your interface is likely to move. How are you going to deal with that problem? So, um, in a, uh, so in a real engine, 
um, we use uh, uh, what we call under platform dampers that are small metal masses that we put between the blades. These metal masses during vibration, they of course vibrate. So the idea is to mount a lot of shear transducers in those metal masses so they are attached to the, to the actual damper. They send the vibration and of course we can actually monitor if the ultrasound uh, reflection and transmission is constant and this will mean that there is a stick vibration. Otherwise, if it's changing, we can really interpret that something is going on in terms of sliding. So it's, it's actually simple because the ultrasound transducer can be really mounted either on the damper or directly inside the, the blade. And this is what, in fact, this is the next step of this research is just to mount it on the real blades. Thank you. Uh, this is Jan from Glasgow. So I have one question. It, it looks like your samples is in flat to flat contact. So how can you guarantee that they're parallel? Listen, because yep. okay. you might have an edge contact. Because do you have some sort of like self align? Yes, this is a, a good question. So all the experiments that I conducted, um, they uh, were with the contact in a steady state where there was a full contact. So you can see that here um, the interface is a new specimen, but actually when there is where we can actually see a black spot. So we only um, sent the ultrasound once there was a full established contact, because of course at the beginning of the experiments, the contact is not fully extended over the whole interface. Okay, thanks. So this non-initial contact, is that related to um, bedding in of the system or what would you suggest yeah. is happening? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And how does this relate to friction? Are you, um, are you mentioning uh, the ultrasound transmission that we observed or, or just the question about the initial contact? I want to know how the how, what you see is happening as you change from a new specimen to a worn in. Okay, how so long that takes to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, before every experiment, we always scan the interface, and we actually see that there is a very slight curvature on the interface. So at the beginning of the contact there is uh, always a contact in a determined spot. And uh, at the beginning of the, uh, we also send ultrasound at the beginning, and we see that the transmission is lower. While when there is a, a full established contact, transmission, because of course, where is extended. I didn't show uh, those uh, ultrasound uh, transmission results in this presentation, because I wanted to focus more on the change due to the onset of sleep. But this is something also that we observed a change of the average transmission with wear. Thank you. And this is also actually interesting because we can even use the average transmission to monitor the state of wear in real structures. So is uh, Alfredo, possible? yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, Alfredo, no, you ahead. Is, there, is there an approach where you can calibrate or determine the amount of reflection or transmission to the contact area? Yeah, so the, um, it's important um, to calibrate and that's why we actually performed the uh, numerical simulations because we wanted actually to check because in this simulation you can see that there is no contact. So the signal is fully reflected. And we actually use the ratio between the incident signal, that is the signal that we send, and the actual reflected signal. Because you can see here that the incident signal is much larger than the signal that we reflect. And we actually can cross calibrate by using the ratio that we obtain from numerical simulations. Is this and, what and, you mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and the relative uh, frequency of the, the ultrasound, ultrasound pulses to the actual, the, the friction variations of the, the, the movement, is there a particular window you need to sit within? So um, the, the, the ultrasonic, um, um, the, the frequency of the ultrasound uh, 
uh, wave is uh, two megahertz, and that depends on the shear transducer that we use, while the frequency of vibration, hysteresis loops, is up to 1,000 hertz. And in this experiment, we um, were vibrating at 100 hertz. We also tried the uh, different... Frequencies. Guys, we, we just need to jump in because we've just gone uh, way over the time there, so uh, we need to uh, go on probably with the next talk. I just want to thank Alfredo again, and I just want to clarify that Professor Johann uh, Hofnagels from the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology is also uh, has been with us from the beginning of the um, session, who's also uh, on the judging panel. So I'll just hand over to uh, Harry now to introduce our next speaker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry, I know there's questions in the Q and A. Uh, um, we'll have to. Leave those for another time. Uh, so next up, we've got uh, Shitid Upade from Johns Hopkins. He'll be actually presenting work from his PhD, which recently finished uh, this summer uh, from the University of Florida. So I'll hand over to him now. Thank you, Dr. Arora, for introducing me. Okay, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kshitaj Upadhyay and in this talk, I'll be presenting my research on the simple shear characterization of soft materials. So let us start by looking at what soft materials are. A soft material is a generic term that is used to describe many different artificial and natural polymers. Uh, for example, rubber elastomers, which are used to make many commercial products, are soft materials, and so are hydrogels, which are used in many biomedical applications. From a mechanical modeling perspective, human tissues and organs are also modeled as soft materials. A commonality between all these materials is that they exhibit large and nonlinear deformations and their mechanical response is a strong function of their microstructure as well as the strain rate that they're exposed to. It is because of these complications that it becomes important for us to characterize these materials in a wide range of different conditions. Now, extensive evidence from the literature as well as my own papers on the subject have conclusively shown that in order to calibrate any constitutive model for these materials, we need experimental data from the primary deformation modes of compression, tension, and shear. Now, despite this, the existing literature mainly consists of only uniaxial experiments, because partly because simple shear condition is inherently triaxial, which makes it difficult to validate and maintain a simple shear deformation in an experiment. In addition, there are edge effects, which are compressive and tensile stresses at the corners of the specimen caused due to gripping constraints, which make it challenging to maximize the strain homogeneity in the bulk of the sample. The third and fourth challenges come from the fact that the shear wave speed in these materials is extremely slow when compared to the longitudinal wave speed, and thus a large chunk of the stress strain response represent, is represented by the transient regime in which the material's stress is not equilibrated. And thus it becomes challenging and equally important to calculate this wait time, which I define as the time we must wait in order to get the steady state response. It is only after the calculation of this wait time can we separately analyze the transient and steady state stages of deformation. These four challenges make up my challenges box and I'll revisit them during the course of my presentation. In this research, I developed a new dynamic shear experiment that overcomes these challenges. And the test that I developed is based on a modified split Hopkins and pressure bar in which a single lap shear friction is sandwiched between the incident and the transmission bar of a traditional SHPB. The specimen is mounted uh, between the two lap plates of this fixture using sinoacrylate adhesive and also clamped using mounting plates. When the striker bar is impacted to the incident bar, the resulting compressive wave pushes lap one to first a linearly rising velocity and then a constant velocity, causing simple shear in the specimen, which looks like this. Now, one of the important considerations in the design of any dynamic experiments is the specimen dimensions. In all our experiments, we make sure that the length to width ratio is at least greater than 7.5, which is in accordance to this analytical inequality derived by Gussell and Bonnie, which makes sure that the edge effects are confined to the corners of the specimen and the shear stresses in the sample are at least an order of magnitude larger than the unwanted normal stresses. We also make sure that the thickness to width ratio is greater than 0.18, which is in accordance to the plate buckling criteria of simple shear, which makes sure that the transverse compressive stresses do not buckle our specimen. 
In all our experiments, we measure force using the force transducer sandwich between transmission and lab two. And this force transducer also triggers high speed imaging by the camera. We use 2D DIC to measure the strain in the material, which is a full field non-contact optical strain measurement technique that tracks the motion of a speckle pattern on the sample. We use black spray paint for this purpose. This video shows the shear strain map in a sample, which is being sheared at 900 second inverse strain rate. By using the force and stress signal from the force transducer and strain and strain rate from the 2D DIC, we make what is called the master curve. In this curve, the magenta line shows the strain rate versus time response. The, the red line shows the strain versus time and the blue line shows the stress versus time. The idea of this master curve is a major contribution of my work because it allows the delineation of the different stages of deformation. I call the first stage as momentum diffusion because in this stage, the shear momentum is being transferred between the two lap plates. And although there is a, a finite strain signal, there is no stress signal because the shear momentum hasn't yet reached the bottom plate where the stress measurements are made. I call the second stage as inertia effect because during this stage, the strain rate is constantly changing in the material. And so if we look at the continuum uh, mechanics, uh, momentum balance equation, there is a large inertia term. The third stage starts when the strain rate in the sample becomes nearly constant. And so only in this stage do we get a true inertia free material response, which we report at an average strain rate. The fourth stage starts when the lap one impacts the lap two and ca that causes a sudden spike in the stress signal and a fall in the strain rate signal. Because this is caused by an experimental factor and not the material response, we disregard this stage in all further analysis. The first three stages of deformation give us the separate transient and steady state stages of response as well as the wait time when the crossover happens. As I said previously in my introduction, these tests are very uncommon and there have been only two previous attempts at uh, creating SHPV based dynamic shear tests for soft materials. And none of those previous experiments could present the actual steady state material response because of the inability of those experiments to measure the wait time. So if we look at our challenges box again, we just successfully made the wait time measurement and now we can separately analyze the two different stages of deformation. However, before doing that, I want to validate if the deformation mode we are simulating is correct. In order to validate the simple shear state of deformation, I make use of the kinematic description of the simple shear state according to continuum mechanics, which says that the one one component of the green Lagrangian strain should be two times the square of the one two component. To validate whether this is what is actually happening, I plot this blue line, which is the theoretical E11 versus E12 response, and compare it with the red line right here, which is the E11 versus E12 response obtained from DIC from the experiments. We can see that in the stage three of deformation, we get an excellent agreement between the theory and the experiment. Also, the E22 component, which should theoretically be zero, is at least an order of magnitude smaller than the other two strain components. This exercise gives us confidence that the deformation mode we are getting is correct. I also wanted to validate the strain field uniformity in the sample. And for that, I plotted strain in different small square shaped uh, regions across the sample and compared that with the average. Uh, we found out that the maximum deviation in strain is around only 8%. So this exercise uh, gives us confidence that we have the correct simple shear state of deformation with maximum strain homogeneity. And now we can separately analyze the two different stages of deformation. In the transient state of deformation, the shear momentum is traveling from the top to the bottom plate. Juan et al. from our research group showed that the only quantity of interest in this stage is the velocity field across any line segment drawn across the width of the sample. And this is exactly what we get from DIC. These are the shear velocity profiles of any arbitrary line segment at different instances of time. From this velocity field, we also get the momentum diffusion length, which is the length up to which the momentum has diffused at any given time. From these two quantities, the velocity and the momentum diffusion length, we can finally solve the constitutive model, which is the Navier-Stokes equation of startup quit flow and obtain the two model parameters of viscous coefficient and the shear thickening exponent. 
for PDMS, I obtained these values. Coming to the steady state stage of deformation, and in this stage, the stress field has been equilibrated. And finally, we can understand the mechanical response using stress strain data. These are the stress versus strain responses of PDMS from strain rates ranging from 100 to 1,000 per second strain rates. Notice that these do not start from origin. Uh, origin because, uh, because this, is, this represents only stage three response. If we analyze the modulus from these plots, we can get the modulus versus strain rate plot, which shows a weak strain rate sensitivity between the quasi-static experiments that we conducted and the simple shear experiments that we conducted using our dynamic test. This type of strain rate sensitivity can be modeled using a visco hyperelastic strain rate relation, uh, cisco hyperelastic stress strain relation, such as this one that I recently proposed in one of my papers, which has two model constants. For PDMS, I obtained this as the neo hookian model parameter and this as my rate sensitivity constant. And with this, I overcome the fourth challenge as well. So in summary, I have designed a new simple shear experiment in the dynamic regime that not only gives me a correct simple shear deformation with homogeneous strain field, but with the idea of the wait time, I can also analyze the two stages of deformations separately, all with a single experiment without requiring any extensive modifications to the set, test setup and just using the traditional compression SHPV setup. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for that. So do we have any questions from the panel? Okay, maybe I will start this time. Uh, this is uh, Fabrice Pierron from the University of Southampton. Um, so you justified um, the, the fact that uh, you've left the transient state by the fact that you have a more constant strain rate. Now, the real definition of this is when acceleration effects can be um, neglected. Mm -hmm. So you have the IC data. I was quite surprised that um, you didn't actually try to calculate acceleration because you could have a direct measure of this rather than to have to justify it from a sort of plateau in the strain. If you have displacement as a function of time, mm -hmm. then you can have acceleration. Did, did you have a look at that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And I think the, the acceleration is directly related to the strain rate. And so if you look at this slide where I talk about the simple shear state, the acceleration in simple shear is rho times the, the the gamma double dot component. So, so basically when I say that the strain rate is constant, I mean that the strain acceleration is zero, which means that the gamma double dot is zero. The double derivative of the strain is zero. So, so that's what I mean when I say that the, the strain rate is nearly Yes, I, I, I understand that, but you, you didn't calculate acceleration, which is a pity because you have it. Not only that, but with the acceleration, you can actually calculate stiffness or reconstruct stress through the equilibrium equation. So you would actually be able to cover the first part of the test, which you're missing, thanks mm -hmm. to your acceleration signal. In the first part of the test, in the transient state of deformation, there is a very high inertia. So I can't, I can't, uh, model that with any constitutive model that assumes no inertia effect. It no, but you measure it. You measure it through your acceleration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I use a different model to model that response. There is a transient momentum diffusion during that stage of deformation. And I model it using this Navier-Stokes equation. So I am modeling it. Okay. I was hey, uh, there. Go for it. Johan of Nagels here. A question. Um, can, can, you, can you please show the, the shear modulus as a function of str uh, uh, strain rate again? That plot. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, yes. Yeah. So here, so that's the dash line that's your model, right? That mm -hmm. also you model it with two parameters. But if I already looking at the quasi-static measurements, to me, it seems there's already a, um, uh, like sort of like an upper trend almost, right? 
Yeah, and, yeah. And then looking at um, at your high strain rate um, experiments, actually, of course, the scatter. The, the, you you try to to um, to ma to of course uh, obtain your shear models as accurate as possible. But the scatter, of course, is huge. Yes. So, um, so specifically with these two parameters that you identify with this model, mm -hmm. can can you say something about it? Because it could, in my opinion, it seems like it could well be that that your, your rate-dependent model could be something completely different. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. So I, could, I, I could easily fit a straight line mm -hmm. um, through this or well, any kind of other model. So, yeah, yeah, so what this is, is actually a straight line. This is a log, log x-axis and this is a straight line. So if you look at this model, the visco hyperelastic model, it's basically a generalized form with many different model parameters possible. So, but I just took one term of that generalized model. And this is the most basic form of that visco hyperelastic model. And when you take this stress and calculate the modulus, it actually gives the gives a straight line. And K here, K is basically related, directly related to the linear rate of change of modulus with strain rate. So K can only capture a linear rate sensitivity. And this is a simplification that I make here in the modeling. And if I, ha if I were to use even more complicated terms in the, in the actual generalized model, then I could actually model uh, a higher order, uh, high, higher order variation between the modulus and the strain rate, such as the quadratic dependence or the cubic dependence. But this is the most basic model that I used just to demonstrate the, the, the fitting of the visco hyperelastic regime, the stage three. But the, but the fitting doesn't really prove anything, I guess, right? It doesn't prove that, that uh, a linear dependence is, a, is the correct one. It could be anything. Yeah, but do, 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 considering the, the the variability in your measurement. Yeah, definitely, and I think I think the variation of modulus with strain rate. You are right that it doesn't show anything. What matters most is how the model fits the entire stress strain response, and this is also what I get from the from from my fitting. If you if you see here. When I use the model to fit the, the data at higher strain rates, this is what I get. So I get really good fittings. If you see at 180 per second, I get, so even if there is variability in the stress strain response, I get around 10% error. If you see, if you look at here, the higher strain rate responses, 13% error, 12% error, 6% error. So although there is variability, which is very common in dynamic experiments, the model does a very well, very good job in fitting the response if you look at the average percentage error. So this is what I minimize when I, when I fit the model and not the, not the modulus. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We had one final quick question from Liz. Yes, I mean, that graph you were showing a little while ago with the low strain rate and high strain rate data, mm -hmm. It looked to me, I mean, I couldn't quite see how many data points you had, but the low strain rate looked as though it had a gentle slope up. Um, what, is there some jump between the low strain rate and the high? Because mm -hmm. it's a viscoelastic material. Mm -hmm. So are we kicking in a different mechanism? Was I just imagining that the, the, that the early, the low strain rate points were on an increasing gradient? That slide you showed, um, yeah, yeah, I think like like this. So this is something that is very common in, in, in dynamic experiments. In the quasi-static regime, there is no, so the system is in equilibrium. There is no viscous effects in the system. There is no viscous overstress in the system. So these polymer chains are equilibrated at every point of time during the any, course. Have you done any statistical analysis to see whether between your 10 to the minus three strain rate and your 10 to the minus one, that is or isn't an increase. Definitely, in yeah, yeah. I have done a statistical statistical analysis and this paper has actually been, been published and there is a statistically significant increase in the modulus between the quasi-static and the dynamic strain rate. There is a statistic. Well, I was leaning over the, the three quasi-static, which is a factor of a hundred difference, isn't it? There is no, there is no statistically significant increase in modulus from the, in the, within the quasi-static regime. There is not. Okay, there is not. You. Yeah. 
Okay, thank, thanks for that. Um, I'll draw questions to a close on this presentation. Um, and I'll hand over to Daniel um, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. So our, Thank you. Next, so our next speaker is Michelle Haar from the University of Michigan in the United States. Great, whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, my name is Michelle Haar, and today I'm going to talk about the effect of temperature and temp um, temperature on and microtexture on Ti6242 under dwell fatigue loading. This work is done between myself at the University of Michigan and my two advisors, Professor Samantha Daly at UCSB and Dr. Adam Pilchak at AFRL. So Ti6242 is used in the compressor section of jet engines up to about 565 degrees Celsius, and it's utilized there for its creep and low cycle fatigue resistance. Yet these components are known to fail unexpectedly early due to the phenomenon of dwell fatigue. So dwell fatigue fundamentally deviates from low cycle fatigue in that at the peak of each uh, loading cycle, the peak stress is held for a set period of time. And that's meant to mimic the um, long duration of peak stress that those components experience during takeoff and cruise. And so each one of those trapezoidal waveforms represents one flight cycle. And um, whenever you compare a uh, fatigue experiment that's been loaded with a dwell fatigue cycle versus a low fatigue cycle, you have a significant reduction in lifetime. And the ratio between those two lifetimes of your cyclic lifetime and your dwell lifetime are termed the dwell debit. And this debit for Ti6242 can be up to 10 to 20 times of that cyclic lifetime. And that is um, attributed to the anisotropy of the HCP crystal structure of the alpha particles of that titanium alloy. So depending on the orientation of the crystal structure relative to the loading direction, you have grains that are going to deform very easily via basal and prismatic slip versus grains that are not going to deform easily because they're oriented for pyramidal slip, which is about three times more difficult to activate than those softer systems. And the worst case scenario is whenever you have one of those soft grains directly next to one of those hard grains under loading in your microstructure. So upon loading, your soft grain will have dislocations that form and the traverse through the material until they meet that hard soft interface and create a pile up, wherein the soft grain will eventually stress relax, no longer be able to carry its load and shed its load onto the hard grain, creating a location of high stress that will often um, fracture via quasi cleavage and create a ideal location for early crack nucleation. And so this phenomenon is um, sensitive to both microstructure and temperature. And the particular microstructural feature that we're concerned with in this study is microtextured regions which are defined as clusters of similarly oriented alpha grains. And so in this particular micrograph here um, from previous work um, at UCSB, you can see you have a soft MTR here and a hard MTR here where all these grains, um, it's colored by orientation. And upon um, applying a tensile load to this sample and monitoring it via DIC and an SEM, they were able to see that they had um, slip that traversed through the entirety of the softer MTR, the blue, and then abruptly stopped at that hard soft interface, indicating and supporting this belief that they have in the community that these MTRs sometimes behave as almost like giant grains, so those longer um, slip lengths are going to create a larger dislocation pileup and thereby creating an even earlier crack nucleation due to the load shedding effect. Um, load shedding is also dependent on temperature, where whenever you run these experiments, um, your dwell experiments and your cyclic fatigue experiments at room temperature, and you compare those two results, you have that dwell debit. If you um, increase the temperature and run those experiments at about 120 degrees C, you see a maximum where there's the greatest disparity between your dwell lifetime and your cyclic lifetime. But as you continue to increase that temperature up to about 200 degrees C, you no longer have a dwell debit. Your dwell lifetime and your cyclic lifetimes are essentially the same. And while there are a few models in the field to describe and understand the mechanisms behind this temperature dependence and to understand those microstructural effects, um, there isn't a lot of experimental evidence or experimental investigation as to the mechanisms or why or how or what these things are actually doing. And so that's where my work comes in. So the experiments that I've run um, use uh, dwell fatigue samples that have been cut out of a highly microtextured um, tie titanium material, which are then loaded um, ex situ with that trapezoidal waveform dwell fatigue experiment that we are, uh, loading form that we were discussing. 
And then after a predetermined number of cycles, the sample is fully unloaded from its load rig and then carried delicately over to an SEM and placed inside so that I can collect uh, digital image correlation data over the entirety of the gauge section of the sample. So here is the um, orientation map collected via EBSD previous to starting the experiment. And then after two cycles, the sample was removed and collected uh, the digital image correlation over the entirety. And then placed back in its loading condition, loaded some more, and then removed again and looked after 200 cycles. Something that's important to note about these strain maps is that they're over that entire four by two and a half millimeter um, gauge section. And they're about made up of about 200 individually stitched tiles. And there's about 250 million data points per one of these images. Meaning that we have the resolution and the information that we need to look at these individual slip traces and investigate and identify them um, over the entirety of a very large microstructural statistically significant area of the sample. And so we ran that experiment at room temperature, and then we repeated the same experiment using um, running them in an ambient temperature of that 120 C case, which we know should have the peak dwell uh, debit, and our 200 C case, where we expect to not see much dwell effect. And again, running those after two cycles, and then continuing to cycle up to 200 cycles. And one of the things that we can very clearly see from like a comparative structure from the room temperature in 120 C where we expect to see a dwell debit versus the 200 C where we don't expect to see a dwell debit is that we have significantly more slip activity in the room temperature and 120 C cases than in the 200 C case. And we also have accumulated, um, it's accumulated significantly more quickly. So we have a greater rate of accumulation of slip and strain as well as just more strain overall. The other thing that we can clearly see um, as we continue to cycle through at every single temperature is that it clearly is related to the microstructure in that regions that have little to no strain after two cycles continue to have little to no strain after with additional cycling, but the regions that have already slipped continue to slip and continue to accumulate more and more slip activity. Again, indicating that this is a microstructurally driven process. And so then the question is, is what about that microstructure drives this process? And so we want to think about this in terms of our microtextured regions that we were talking about before, where this map here has taken the orientation mapping from the EBSD and run it through a Dream 3D pipeline with very standard um, microtextured region segmentation processes. And then we've also taken those strain maps and been able to segment out those individual slip traces and then overlaid them on top of that MTR map shown here as those black lines. And the thing that's incredibly clear from this is that those microtextured regions are not behaving homogeneously. They're not behaving as structural units or giant grains. We have slip that does exist within them, but it doesn't traverse the entire way through. It's not bound by this entire, these entire microtextured regions are not acting as units. And so the question is, is what are this, what is this microstructural characteristic that it's behaving like if it's not these traditionally defined MTRs? And one of the things that we found is that by overlaying this with our Schmidt factor of our basal Schmidt factor, we see that these um, slip features are contained within sub features of our MTRs that have a very high basal Schmidt factor. And that can be seen at, to exist at every single temperature. And the other thing is, is that they are co-located. They're regions where we have this easy transfer of our basal slip. And so something that's important to note is the um, spatial location of those grains. And so in figure A, we have the idea of them being co-located, but and we also have our um, parallel alignment of our basal slip um, plane for easy um, transfer, and they're well aligned so that they can transfer from one to another. In um, figure B, while we still have parallel basal slip planes and co-located grains, those basal planes are not um, aligned well for slip transfer, so we're not going to obtain those long range slip features. And so the question is, is we know that all of the slip is existing within these basal regions, but what type of slip activity do we actually have? And so what we're able to do is we're able to take the theoretical angle of those um, slip traces and compare them with the uh, projected, the, we're able to take the actual angle of the slip traces with the projected angle from um, 
our orientation map that we would expect to get, and then identify what type of slip traces we have. And for every single case, we have basal slip that is dominating um, the slip activity with a very little prismatic slip and a little bit of pyramidal. And so for each one of these cases, since they're happening in regions of basal with high basal schmid factors and it's basal slip activity, um, it's being that is what's driving this load shedding phenomena. That is what's driving these long range slip features. And that's incredibly important um, whenever we're considering how things are acting cooperatively and what's important relative to load shedding and dwell fatigue phenomenons. And with that, I would like to conclude. And I guess it doesn't want me to, you to see my conclusion slide. Um, Cause my screen just went black, but uh, that is what's, I don't know. Um, oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, just the conclusions are that we know that it's a microstructurally driven process by the fact that we see those high and low strain regions that um, initiate early. We know that it is, uh, we have more strain that's happening at dwell sensitive temperatures than at dwell insensitive temperatures. Uh, and that's indicative of what temperatures are important for load shedding. Um, our basal slip is dominating and that the uh, location and range of those basal oriented grains are the features that we need to consider and think about whenever we're modeling and um, determining what's going to limit our dwell fatigue lifetime in these components. And with that, I would like to say thank you um, and open the floor for questions. Thanks very much, Michelle. So now we have about six minutes for questions. Okay, maybe I'll start again. Um, uh, this is Fabrice. So um, I, I was surprised that you were using Epsilon YY um, to, to show the um, the, the, the effect of, of the slip. I would have expected that something like the, the maximum shear strain would have been uh, better because it's not dependent on the orientation. Yes, so um, this is more for visualization. You are correct that the shear strain, so when actually determining and finding those slip traces, we used all three strain components and those slip traces are going to exist as discontinuities in the field. Um, and so we did use all three to find those discontinuities and actually extract them for all of our analysis. Um, the Y is where we had the largest amount of strain. And so since these were very low strain plastic experiments, it was just significantly easier to see um, in the Y strain field. But why do you have a Y strain field if it's slip? I mean, slip is shear. So yes. what is creating the Y strain? Um, so the important thing is that these are just discontinuities, like there isn't really a uh, high strain there, right? There's just a discontinuity in the strain field. And so it's created and expressed as a trace or as a line of high strain. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not quite sure. If there's a strain, it means this, they're moving apart. The strain's actually not very large, 7 to 10 Correct. to the minus 3, but 1% of strain. I mean, this point are moving apart vertically. So that, that's not consistent with a shear strain. So um, that actually isn't the value of strain. So there is very, very little strain occurring. Um, and so I could also have shown this in the shear direction or component. Um, the big thing here is that it acts like there's a big strain or it acts like there's this large strain or this bright yellow region um, because there is a discontinuity. Is this coming from a, an out of plane uh, slip that would that hit the surface and then sort of mushrooms, which would give you with two DDIC on the surface, the impression that you have an actual strain, but it's actually a shear plane that mm -hmm. is through um, the thickness and hitting the surface. Yes. Jonas Nagels here. Um, I was wondering, um, from these results, can you also uh, better explain actually the, this, the solid bell curve that you had with the dwell fatigue the ratio? Uh, the, the, um, 
So uh, that, that's sort of like this peak at 120 degrees Celsius. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't hear anything back on that, basically. So basically the, the end result where you said that everything was basal slip dominated, well, that was the case for all three temperatures. But I, 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 you know, so what's now the connection actually with the, with this, this, this bell curve? Yes, sorry. So I chose in this particular um, presentation, since it was limited in time, to focus on the microtextured regions. And since I ran my temperatures, at, I ran my experiments at temperature, also needed to show the temperature effect. Um, the separate idea that we have behind temperature and those expressions of the bell curve um, is that since we're one of the theories is that at 200 C, you would expect to see um, significant strain everywhere, and we don't see that. Um, and so relating back to the bell curve, we're thinking that the um, mechanism doesn't fundamentally change from 120 Z to 200 C. It actually has a lot to do with um, the fact that if you're heating it, your overall um, yield strength is going to drop significantly. And so as you, um, you're gonna have a more homogeneous um, yield of the entire material because you're going to have a reduction in anisotropy and so that is why you have significantly less strain overall or less slip activity but that it's the same mechanism it's the same reasons um, you still have basal slip first you still have a lot of the same things you're just not seeing it as much because you have significantly lower yield which means that you're loading it um, to a significantly smaller portion of its yield for the entire material. Does that make sense? Well, the, the uh, lower yield uh, strength, I would expect actually that that for the same kind of, uh, of, of force or stress dominated loading, um, that you would actually have more uh, strain. So I understand that it makes mm -hmm. it more homogeneous, but why would it actually lead to, to a lower strain? So, no, so it doesn't... So the, so the idea is that it's more hom homogeneous. The material yeah, itself has less anisotropy. And that understand, but, but I yes. would expect more homogeneous, but then also a higher strain if, you're, if, if you believe that uh, the yield stress drops, which makes sense at a higher temperature. Yes, but and everything... Stress, is... But the strain, the, 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 the strain doesn't increase, it actually decreases, right? Yes, so, so everything, everything is loaded to, the, um, is to a temperature-adjusted yield, is that 90% of its temperature adjusted yield strength. Um, and so the idea is, is that you've dropped that, the fraction, oh, okay. does that make sense? So it's, you've actually dropped how much you're deforming everything because everything's acting more homogeneously. So if you kind of think of the average response, you're at an even lower portion of but in terms of the absolute, the, the, the absolute force that you applied as an external boundary condition that sort of like also uh, dropped for 200 or the, the, you decreased that for 200 degrees Celsius, basically. Correct. Yes. Yes. Because it's the temperature adjusted yield strength. Sorry if that was unclear. Uh, there's just one question here from one of the attendees on the chat, which is, uh, why do you say that those localized strains observed um, in 200 degrees Celsius are not detrimental? though they are not widespread? Um, so the idea is not that they're not detrimental necessarily, but that it's, um, we're really caring here, at least we're thinking about this from like our load shedding and our pile up and these early crack nucleations. And so, yes, we could have slip and strain that happens eventually, but the idea that we don't, ha these things aren't a lot of strain that are then piling up at boundaries that are causing load shedding effects that are then causing you to have early crack nucleation. Great. So um, I think with that, we'll uh, thank, uh, thank Michelle again, and um, Harry will introduce uh, our last speaker. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, so right now we will have a presentation from the uh, chair for the BSSM, uh, Andrew Ramage, coming on now. Um, and meanwhile, the judges will deliberate on the scores and we'll be announcing the winners shortly after Andrew's talk. So I'll hand over to him now whilst I disappear. It's lovely. Well, thank you very much. That was... Uh... 
our, our first virtual event, which seems so far to be going extremely well. Uh, my name is Andrew Ramage um, from a company called Techni Measure and the incumbent uh, society chair for the British Society for Strain Measurements. Uh, so whilst the panelists are now uh, deliberating um, and trying to come to a, a, a decision on those four excellent presentations, um, I'm just going to say a few words about the society and um, and uh, what, what we've got going on at the moment um, in these uh, in these times. And so, uh, uh, thank thank you firstly to uh, Harry and Daniel for for organising the, the YSA this year. Uh, thank you very much to Swansea for hosting it. Thank you very much to our panelists for judging it who are hopefully probably aren't listening to me right now because they're busy scoring uh, and thank you very much to everyone who contributed we had 21 submissions this year and i know it's a very difficult job to um choose and down select to four um and how the decision is going to be made between these four is is uh, is beyond me so uh, i look forward to seeing the results and presenting them to you shortly um in the meantime then uh I would uh, like to talk very briefly about the British Society for Strain Measurement. What, what is the society? Um, it's been around for 56 years. It was founded in 1964. Um, uh, it's a non-profit scientific membership organization. So we, we don't, we're not out to make a profit. We're out to promote the core value of the society, the core aim that we're trying to do is to promote the knowledge and the application of advanced strain measurement, stress analysis and experimental mechanics techniques into industry and academia. Uh, that is really what we try to do as a society. Um, we sit at the interface between industry, academia and the wider engineering community to promote the dissemination of new techniques and best practice. And we've seen that already in these presentations from uh, just today and in the other presentations at our other events and workshops it's all the, the, the advances that we see in experimental mechanics are um, astounding and really the, the the way that computing power is able to um, help us with some of the numerical modeling capabilities that we have now and some of the uh, experimental techniques that are available to us, uh, it's, it's incredible. And it's a really exciting time for experimental mechanics. How do we achieve our aims? How is the society run? This is something that was a bit confused to me when I first started. So I thought I'd just really quickly go through it right now. Um, the society is managed and overseen by a national council, which is a committee that we meet three times a year. Um, as an actual functionality within the UK, we are a limited company, we are VAT registered, and we have two part-time paid positions, which is the society manager, Amanda Bowler, and uh, the marketing and administration executive, uh, Bianca Gale. Um, other than that, the societies are run voluntarily um, from a very wide range of volunteers across industry and academia, um, for which I'm very thankful. It's, um, it's, a, it's an exciting society to be a part of. Um, everyone is really enthusiastic about what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so below the National Council, or, or I should have say probably more importantly than the National Council, the, the core of the society is run by three committees. We have the CERCO or Certification Committee that looks after the, um, the, delivery, the organization and the deliverance of the certification scheme for resistance strain gauges. So a series of seminars and training courses and examinations um, that promote best practice within the industry for the installation um, of the black art of uh, applying and taking measurements from strain gauges. Um, it's very important that that is done right because you can get very wrong results if you do it incorrectly. So to have some kind of a certified um, scheme by which you can say that as a, a strain gauge installer, I am certified to the BSSM's scheme. That's it's it's a very important aspect, and it's um, something that the the society delivers um, very well uh, globally as well. I should add, not just within the UK. We also have the SACCO, the Scientific and Technical Committee. Now that committee looks after the organisation of uh, seminars, workshops, and other events that society. Uh, um, performs throughout the year. Not so many this year. This is our this is our first since lockdown. Um, it's been a very challenging year for the SACCO and well for the whole society really. Um, but we're yeah, very pleased to be finally delivering this first virtual event and there will be more to follow. 
Uh, but Satco uh, really picks and chooses and we're always looking for feedback. If, if you feel like there is an event that would help you in your research that, that brings together academia and industry into an event where you, everyone sits down and presents researches and findings, um, or we have particular speakers come in and, and talk about how uh, certain experimental techniques are done, how numerical techniques are performed, um, in order to disseminate and promote the very specific themes, then we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to be able to put those events on to uh, engage the wider society and uh, promote the best practice throughout industry and academia. So, so um, we have an, a series of events planned. Um, we have a series of events that we undertake every year, normally four, five, six events in a year. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's the organization organized by the Scientific and Technical Committee uh, within the BSSM. And then finally, the CONFCO or the Conference Committee. So as well as the uh, SACCO events, we have an annual conference, which was to be right now at the moment, was meant to be held in Oxford University. We have decided to postpone it rather than trying to hold our entire conference as a virtual event this year. Um, we've postponed it to next year, same time, uh, in the same place at the University of Oxford this next year. Um, and we hope um, that that will be allowed to go ahead um, as, as um, things start to return to normal, hopefully throughout the next 12 months. Um, so conference committee um, organizes the annual conference uh, and ma makes that happen. Um, um, the YSA, the Young Stress Analysis Competition, is also falls under the remit of the conference committee and that is normally uh, performed within the annual conference. Um, so uh, that's what happens there. And then as well as that, we have something called the Postgrad Conference or the PGEM, Postgraduate Conference for Experimental Mechanics, which is normally held just before Christmas and will be held this year as a virtual event um, coming up. So the conference committee looks after that as well. Uh, why? Why be a part of the British Society for Strain Measurement? Well, we have a number of different ways to become a member of the society. You can either be an individual member, your company or your corporation become a corporate member. Um, your university can become an educational member. Uh, and then also as a student, uh, you can have a student membership, which gives you all the benefits, but it's a lower rate. Um, we have dedicated early careers group and activities put on such as the YSA competition, the postgraduate experimental mechanics and other events. Um, we have opportunities for continual professional development, um, which look great on a CV, obviously. It's a very important part of any career nowadays is to have CPD on your CV so that companies looking to recruit can see what training you have received throughout your career. Uh, we. The British Society for Strain Measurement, as I've already said, is, is really, its core aim is to transfer technology through the delivery of seminars, workshops, conferences and exhibitions. And as a society member, you will get reduced rates um, and even free of charge in some instances, um, entry to those events. Um, so it is well worthwhile being a member to be able to um, benefit from those. Um, as a member, you can join any of the committees and get involved in organizing um, any event or, or you can join the conference committee or if you want to be involved in the delivery of the certification committee, you can. Or if you want to sit on the National Council, we're always looking for new membership um, on those committees to help run the, the society. Uh, you have direct access as a member to the BSSM archive and um, the member section of the website, which has uh, all of the various um, presentations that have been made throughout various events that we've run. Uh, it's a wealth of information there. Um, and as a member, you have access to all of that. You also have online access, and this is a very important part. So the British Society for Strain Measurement um, started a journal back in 1965, very shortly after its conception, which is now published by Wiley. Um, and uh, it's called Strain. Um, and as a member, you have online access to every single journal ever published by, uh, in, in the strain journal uh, and there's a lot of information there's a lot of papers um, and it's well worth a look um, so if you are already a member please just go and have a good look through it um, if you're not yet a member then well you're missing out because there's a lot a lot of information there in that journal um, and as well as that you also have access to the um, society of experimental mechanics um, experimental techniques um, content too so there, there's there's a big benefit there for being a member 
of the society. And something we're trying to put together at the moment is a technical expert database. So if you have a question that you need an answer to, um, you can ask it um, on, on, on the website and then somebody from within the society will be, hopefully be able to put their hand up and say, oh, I know the answer to that and they'll be able to help you out directly. Um, so that's a, a brilliant benefit of, of the membership. Something we've been investing uh, in over the last year or so, we've been talked about for many, many years, is a new website, um, a, a big, a big updated, refreshed website that uh, um, will work on your mobile phone. Will we'll be, uh, it, it's really exciting. Um, the website is easy to remember www.bssm.org it's not quite launched yet um, either the very end of this week or sometime early next week probably early next week by the sounds of it Monday or Tuesday next week uh, the new website should go live so I'd encourage everybody who's listening to me right now to next week maybe maybe Tuesday or Wednesday have a look uh, and then have a good look around the new website if you have any if you spot any mistakes do let us know um, if you uh, if you have any suggestions then uh, please let us know any feedback any comments will be welcomed um uh otherwise enjoy enjoy the content um and we're we're, we're going to continue to build on the content in that uh, website um over the coming months uh it's very exciting um so what we're here for today the young stress analyst competition uh this has been an annual event that's been sponsored by airbus since 2007 um it's an opportunity to present research for those early in their career. So the, the word young uh, doesn't necessarily have to mean young. We're not an ageist society. Uh, it just means young career. So if you, you, you can be early in your career um, in, in experimental mechanics or strain and you can present your research in a relatively informal, straight, straightforward, competitive environment. Um, it's a global competition as we've seen today. Um, it's, it's fantastic to see research presented from around the world. Um, and uh, you know, we're not bound to the UK by any stretch. Uh, the abstracts are submitted or, or the summary of your presentation is submitted. It's reviewed by an expert panel. The CEO, as I already mentioned, we had 21 um, submissions, which is, which is fantastic. And I know that the panel had struggled to narrow that down to the top four finalists. Uh, the top four finalists are then usually get a, a free paid for trip to attend the annual conference of the BSSM. Unfortunately, this year there isn't a conference. That's why we're, we're online now on Zoom. But uh, um, nevertheless, that was, that's what would usually happen. Um, you then get to present your work, which, uh, uh, which has been fantastic today. Uh, and then you will all, four of you, receive some kind of cash prize. There'll be three runners up and one winner. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to present those very shortly. Oh, yeah, it's coming coming on its way very soon. Sorry, I just saw a little message coming through now. So um, another thing I wanted to talk about um, is that I've already mentioned it is the postgraduate experimental mechanics, which I would hope would be very interesting to uh, the majority of the people on at the moment. Uh, the PGM conference it brings together PhD and uh, Master of MPhil postgraduate students and early career researchers that are involved in the field of engineering measurement, experimental techniques in stress strain and vibration analysis. Um, it's a it, it offers the opportunity to discuss your research and to start forming a network um, with the wider academia and industry um, in a low pressure and uh, informal environment. Um, the, there, is a, there is a best presentation competition, so there is a, an opportunity to win a bit of cash as well there if you attend, uh, sponsored by Instrom. Um, so the, 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 best, the best presentation of the whole conference will be awarded £125 and then £75 and £50 for the second and third best presentations as, as judged by a collaborative panel of the membership of the people who are there. So um, that's good. Uh, this year, um, unfortunately due to the 
COVID-19 coronavirus. Um, it will be a virtual event, uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure it will be an excellent event still. Uh, it will be hosted by Manchester University, um, and it will be on the 3rd to the 4th of December 2020. Uh, and we're looking for abstracts to be submitted for the presentations by the 30th of October. So uh, get your abstracts in for that. Now, whilst we're waiting for the results to come in, uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the, the past winners of the Young Stress Analysis Competition. So starting in 2007, we had Andrew Conway from University of Sheffield. So this is going back 13 years now. Then uh, from Southampton, we had Shamala Sambabasiam. Uh, Graham Horn from University of Bristol in 2009. In 2010, Nathaniel Connesson from France, LMPF. Uh, our very own Daniel Marvey Hill, who is uh, currently co chair of Confco now uh, from the University of Oxford at the time in 2011, won the Young Analysis. Daniel Lowe from the University of Liverpool in 2012. In 2013, Rodolfo Fleury from the University of Oxford. In 2014, from the California Institute for Technology in the United States, we had Ryan Hurley. 2015, we had Ho Kyung Kim from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. 2016, saw Brian Comroy of the University of Limerick in Ireland. 2017, Elise Chevalier from the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. And 2018, we saw Jared Van Blissesrick from the University of Southampton in the UK. Last year, from the University of Oxford in the UK, we had Akash Trivedi. And then this year, well, that is the question. That is the question. Have we had a result yet? I'll just say that um, the scores were really tight, which is why there was a bit of a delay. Um, I expected but, they would be. But I will hand, let, I'll let Andrew announce the winner and the, the runners up. Okay, so um, in no order, um, let's say there are three runners up, all of equal ranking. Um, and I know, as Harry has said, that the, uh, um, the decision to, to rank these has been extremely difficult. So the three runners up for the 2020 Young Stress Analysis Competition are Kshitis Yupajai, uh, Michelle Ha, and Ger Olafsson, which means that the winner of the 2020 Young Stress Analysis Competition, that I'm very pleased to announce, is Alfredo Fantetti from Imperial College. Um, so thank you very much. Well done, Alfredo. Well done to all four of you. It's been, the, the, the quality of your presentations was, was truly excellent. And the way that you handled the questions as well was very professional, very, very well, very well done by all of you. Um, and as, as Harry says, how, how um, the decision was made to choose the finalist, the winner, it, well, it must've been very difficult. Uh, but Alfredo is the winner. So thank you very much, Alfredo. Well done, congratulations. And hopefully we will see you at the conference next year. Uh, all, all of you and uh, hopefully see some of you at the PGM conference too in December. So thanks again to Swansea University for hosting this, to Harry and Daniel for organising this, to our, our panellists for, for judging this. Um, we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, and thank you to all of the people who submitted uh, all of the 21 submissions and particularly to the four finalists who've done their presentations today. It's been an excellent event and I'm really pleased. So that, that's great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day.